So you've got this really cool new idea and you want everyone to know about it, because if they did, it would change their life. But you're tired of tricking people into just looking at your idea, and so are they. And you don't have time to sit down for an hour with everyone until they finally get it, only to have them forget it about a half an hour later before they can share it with anyone else. Sharing your story on the web seems to be the way to go, but everyone is promising results, and you don't know who you can trust. Well, over at Epiphio Studios, we've been doing something a bit different. And it's changing the way everyone is sharing their ideas, products, new techie awesomeness, or really anything. We start by studying your idea. Then we extract the story. Add two parts awesome sauce and serve chilled as a short online video. Super simple and crystal clear. Which makes people go, oh, I get it now. We call that moment the seeing an imaginary light bulb turn on above your head moment. We've also heard it called an epiphany moment. It only takes a couple of minutes instead of an hour to get there. Now here's where we blow your mind. Ready? When you have a video that creates an epiphany, we call that an epiphio. See, we don't get bogged down with all the details. Instead, we get to the heart of why your idea is meaningful. And we do this using absolutely no trickery. See, everyone loves sharing great ideas, and we make it easy, because epiphios are also fun to watch. So now, instead of doing this, they do this. Isn't the internet a beauty? Oh, and if you're wondering if this approach works, just ask these guys. So, what's your epiphany? Check us out at epiphiostudios.com, and we'll help you share it with the world. Thank you. <laughs> hey guys, it's really good to be here. Uh, I feel completely blown away and honored to, to actually be standing in front of you guys. And that's not some sort of like, you know, whatever weird thing that people say when they say things like that. Um, I, I, this is awesome. This is great to be here. Um, my, my role, I want to just start a little bit with who, who the heck is Epiphio? I mean, obviously, you just saw kind of what we do for, uh, for our clients. But basically, how we understand what we do at Epiphio is that we take, uh, we search for hidden truths, uh, and we basically try and communicate those truths uh, through story. Uh, because we believe that when we do that, uh, we create epiphanies, and that those epiphanies can actually change people's lives. And I know that that sounds grand, changing somebody's life. And sometimes it could change the way they think, the way they feel what they do, what they believe. At some level, in some way, our goal is to change people. Uh, and we're, we're really unapologetic about that because we want to change people for the better. The role that I play at Epiphio uh, is that I lead a team of people known as story leads. And these are some of the most brilliant, hardworking, um, awesome people you will ever meet. This is the team of people at Epiphio who really sit in a, a very unique position within the company, our job is really hard to define. Um, we're sort of like directors, teachers, translators, uh, psychologists, sociologists, problem solvers, strategists, all rolled into one. Um, it's an extremely hard job to do. It's an even harder job to hire for. Um, it, the work that we do is equal parts exhilarating and exhausting, we sit as story leads sort of in this middle space between the client and their story and all of the technicians that are involved in telling that story. Designers, animators, uh, e even uh, the producers who play a part in that role. Uh, audio, uh, there, there's so many different technicians that are involved in creating what we create. And we sort of sit in the midst of all of that and try and lead everyone to the truth and to craft the best story possible. That's what, that's what we do day in and day out. 
And I can tell you firsthand that that work is extremely difficult. Uh, I think it's difficult for uh, a number of reasons. One, just finding that truth is really hard. Secondly, I think weaving it together in some sort of fun, engaging, delightful story is really difficult, especially when you do it time and time and time and time again. But I actually think that that's probably not, those two things aren't the most difficult part of the job. And it makes me think of, of this story. Maybe you've heard it, and if you have, don't give away the punchline. But uh, long, long ago, uh, there was a smuggler who day in and day out would load his donkey with hay because hay was the easiest thing to conceal the stuff that he was smuggling across the border. And so he, every day he would head to the border crossing and the guards would search and search and search and they could never find what he was smuggling. And this happened day after day and days turned into weeks and weeks turned into months and th that turned into years. For years this smuggler would cross the border smuggling and hiding uh, with, with hay what he was what he was stealing. They never caught him and then many many years later after all of everyone had retired one of the border guards saw the smuggler in the marketplace and he grabbed him by the shirt and he said you have to tell me all those years ago what was it that you were smuggling? I have to know. And the smuggler looked him in the eye and said donkeys. And I think that illustrates why our job can be so difficult as story leads and as storytellers. It's when you, you've, you've waded through the, the bullet point of features and benefits that our, client gives, that our clients give us, the WebEx meetings and the pre-call forms and the, 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 the this's and the that's and all of that stuff that clients hand us when they want us to simplify and tell their story. When we've sifted through all of that and we found this thing that we think is actually a powerful truth that the world should know and that if the world could see this and understand it, that it would actually change their lives and it's right in front of the client and we put it right in front of their faces and they just can't see it. They just can't see it. It's right in front of them and they just can't see it. As people who want to bring meaning and truth into the world, when you put it in front of someone and say, let's do this, and they just have a heart, they just almost refuse to see it. That's a really difficult place to be. And it begs the question, why would anyone do that? Why would anyone take a, a truth that has been hidden, that is now brought to the surface and brought to light, why, why would anyone choose not to see it? And I think there's a few reasons. I'll give, I'll give what I think are three decent reasons why. I think the first is we live in a world that is just wrath, just, just totally consumed with fear. I've been so surprised and shocked when I talk with people on the phone, when I talk with clients on the phone, just how terrified everyone is. Everyone's just so scared. They don't want to, they don't want to offend anyone. They, I think sometimes we forget that communication, that marketing, that standing out is about standing out. It's about looking different. It's about not being safe. It's about being memorable. But we're just so scared. We're just so terrified. I think one of the other reasons that we would choose to allow truth to be hidden is that we just think, we just think too small. Um, faster, cheaper, more efficient. Yeah, those are, I get it, those are valuable things. But isn't there more than that? Isn't there more about our products and services than just faster, cheaper, better margins? I think we could aspire to something bigger than that. And I think one of the other reasons is for, there's a, there, there is a very real, real force of habit in the universe. One of the things that I think has made Epiphio somewhat successful in what we do is that none of us know what we're doing. Uh, I didn't go to school for marketing, advertising, video production. Uh, I have no idea what I'm doing. I don't know how you're supposed to do this. I don't know how marketing is done. I really, I'm not, and I'm not being like, that's not false humil humility. I, I'm being serious. Like, I don't know how this is supposed to work. All I know is that I want to communicate meaning in this world. And I'm going to figure it out as I go. 
But for so many of our clients, they've been programmed. This is the way you do things. This is how you talk about things. This is how you communicate things. And that force of habit, I think, prevents them from seeing the opportunity to communicate something really meaningful, some truth that's bigger than what they've ever communicated before. Now, I want to press pause right here because I did not come here to complain about clients. In fact, th that story, just as a side note, I think as an agency, I think we need to find a better story. That whole thing of like the work would be great if it wasn't for the clients, um, I, I think that that kind of, I think we can find a better story. Uh, and I would just, as a challenge to myself and all of us say, uh, you know, why don't we start trusting our clients as much as we wish they would trust us? Uh, and I think when we would do, if we do that, we'll find that we can work together with our clients and create some pretty cool stuff. But I didn't come here to, to, to bash clients or to point the finger at clients and where they make mistakes and where they miss opportunities and where they just don't get what we do, right? The only reason I bring it up is because I would propose that oftentimes we do personally, on a personal level, the exact same thing that our clients do. The, there's, a, there's something that I believe, and that is that life as we know it is the story that we tell every single day to, as we reveal our most important truths to the people who matter most to us. What I mean by that is there are truths that I think that we believe that we allow to be hidden, to remain hidden and undiscovered. And as a result, we fall into the same trap that our clients do. And I think we fall into the trap that they do for all of the same reasons. I think that we are terribly fearful and terribly insecure. I think that we're afraid to stand out at times. We don't want to offend someone. We don't want to stand for something. We don't want to be different. We say that we do, but when it comes down to it, we don't. I think there's also the reality that there is, we all struggle with small thinking too, don't we? If I could just be a little more comfortable, life would be great. If I could just have that promotion, life would be great. If I could just get that job, if I could just win that client, if I could just get this award, if I could just, if I could just, if I could just, that's, that, is that it? Is that, is, that the, is that the highest truth for you? I think there's also the force of habit. I think we struggle with that as well. Day in and day out, we just do the same things we've always done and we don't stop and think, does this, is this really going to take me to where I want to go? For many of us, we don't know what our hidden truths are. They're still hidden, and we can't see them. And for a business, th that has consequences, right? If you're a brand or your company, if you, don't, if you don't recognize that truth, if you don't live into that truth, maybe you don't gain as much market share. Maybe you're, you don't have as much brand awareness. Maybe sales aren't as high as they could be. But for you and for me on a personal level, the stakes are much higher. If you don't know what your truth is, and if you're not aligning your life to that truth every day, there's no telling where your story could take you. I believe firmly that everyone, all of us, are going to end up somewhere. Very few of us will end up there on purpose. 10 years from now, you're gonna be somewhere. You're going to be working at some company. You're going to be in some situation. You're going to be somewhere. The question is, are you going to be there on purpose? Or are you just floating your way along until you get there, hoping that one day your dreams will come true? In life, everyone ends up somewhere. Very few end up there on purpose. The thing that I want to challenge us all, and I, and I mean us in the, the, the sense of myself included, is do you know what your truth is? Do you know what that meaning is? Do you know what that thing that's bigger than the promotion, bigger than the, all of those other things, do you know what that is? And are you aligning your story to that every day? Your life is telling a story. Right now, every day, you are telling a story with your life. And when you tell that story, you are revealing what you believe to be the most true to everyone around you. 
And that's the question I have is, what is that truth? Because if we don't know what it is, if it remains hidden, we run the risk of living a less than life, of creating less than things. And I don't know about you, but I want to create awesome things. I want to do awesome things. I want to live an awesome story. I want to, I want to every day, I want to live into a story that takes me somewhere that's beautiful, that's important, that's significant, that changes people's lives. And I know that at Epiphio, that's one of the things that really permeates our entire culture as a company. We're not interested in just, just making videos. We're not interested in just creating uh, stories for our clients. We want to create our stories. We're a community of people that are looking at one another and saying, how can I help you live into your truth and to tell your story? So what is the, what's, the, what's the, the solution? How do we avoid living a story that's less than? How do we avoid winding up somewhere that we don't want to be one day? I think the answer is one of those answers that's really simple uh, and not easy, right? I think it's discover your truth and tell your story. And I'm, I mean, that is not easy at all. Yes, it's simple, it's obvious, but it's not easy. First of all, it's going to take a lot of work. Um, one of the things that I've really been struck by and I, that I've learned from as I've been at Epiphio is I've watched people take time off of work, not to go to Vegas, not to go to the beach or go on a ski trip. They take time off work so that they can take their families somewhere, unplug, go offline, and pull out the whiteboard and begin to work as hard on their life and their story as they do on the stories that they tell for their clients. And I think that as creatives, we're really bad at that. We're really bad at investing more into the things that we create for other people than we do investing in our own lives. We work harder on that website, that, that layout, that whatever we're doing than we do on designing and thinking about the story that our own lives are telling. So I would say be prepared to work really hard. If you want to discover that truth, if you want to uncover that hidden meaning, be prepared to work really, really hard because it's not going to be easy. And as you go, I don't think you can do it alone. One of the benefits that I think Epiphio brings to our clients is that we're not them. Uh, we don't know all the things they know. Uh, we don't see all the things that they see. We're able to be an outside sort of third party voice. And so my question would be, who do you have in your life that's doing that for you? Who do you have in your life that's helping you think about what is really true and meaningful for you and how you're aligning your story to that every day? Because you can't do it alone. You can't see everything. You can't, you can't perceive all the opportunities that you have. And then lastly, and this is a big one, is be prepared to improvise. Um, one of my favorite quotes is that uh, life is like playing a violin solo in public and learning the instrument as one goes along. I feel that every day. This idea of I'm just making it up as I go and that's, the, that's, that's okay. I know, what I, I know what's meaningful to me. I know what drives me. I know the story that I, I ultimately want to tell and I'm just kind of figuring this out as I play along. And I'm going to make mistakes, and I'm going to play wrong notes, uh, but that's just part of the story. Uh, and it's, it's, it's pretty fun. I'm going, to, I'm going to wrap up with one of probably my favorite stories of all time. And um, some, of, some of the Epiphia guys have heard me tell this story, so sorry. But it's, I think it kind of just, I don't know. I love telling stories, so I'm going to tell a story. Uh, it's about a guy named Morris Silverman, who you've probably never heard of, but in the late 19th, early 20th centuries, uh, early 20th century, uh, there were thousands upon thousands of Eastern European uh, Jews who came to America in search of religious freedom uh, and in search of a really a better life and opportunity for their family. Morris was one of those, and he had always served in his hometown as the shamus at the temple, uh, the synagogue. And if you don't know what a shamus is, it's the, uh, the person who basically serves as the, the synagogue helper. So you can imagine his shock and delight when he gets to the United States, New York City, and he finds 
that there in the paper is an advertisement that the Second Street Synagogue is looking for a shamus. <coughs> Tremendous opportunity for him. So he goes and he applies for the job, and during his interview, which goes really well, at the very end, they ask the question, almost in passing, of course, you can read and write. He says, I, I'm terribly sorry, I, I grew up an orphan, I was never educated. If you need me to pray, I can pray. But I never learned to read and write. He said, well, my good man, I, I'm, I must apologize. Here in America, you must know how to read and write. And of course, he didn't get the job. The next day, he took what little money he had, and he walked, walked out and bought, to the, on the street, he bought a needle and a thread. And he sold that needle and thread. And rather than taking the money he made and spending it, he bought more needle and thread and sold that. And then he bought more and sold that. And eventually he sold from a tray, and then that tray turned into a cart. And then that cart turned into the storefront that he sold in front of. And then he from, went from owning that storefront to owning the entire building. And that's when Morris Silverman discovered his true calling in life. And he began to buy up building after building after building after building after building until he became one of the most successful real estate men in New York City. And the day came when he had to make his biggest deal ever. And he had to borrow a million dollars, which at that time was an astronomical sum of money. And if you needed that kind of money in New York City at that time, there was one place you went, Chase National Bank and greeted in the lobby, he was greeted by none other than John D. Rockefeller himself. John D. Rockefeller welcomes him from the lobby into his office and they sit down across from one another at his huge mahogany desk. And John Rockefeller says, Morris Silverman, you are the epitome of the American spirit. You came here for, with nothing to our country and you've made yourself into one of the most successful real estate men in the city. And I am now going to loan you $1 million. And he pulls out the giant leather checkbook and he flips it open and he spins it around and he slides it across the table and he hands the pen to Morris Silverman. He says, fill out the check for whatever amount you would like. And Morris Silverman looks at the checkbook and he looks at Rockefeller and he looks at the checkbook and he looks at Rockefeller and he thinks about how far he's come in his life and how he started with nothing. And he grabs the pen and in one last moment looks at Rockefeller and says, I can't because I don't know how to read and write. And Rockefeller said, my God, man, do you know what you could have become if you knew how to read and write? And he says, yeah. The shamus at the Second Street Synagogue. <laughs> Life is an improvisation. Storytelling is an improvisation. Know what your truth is. Know what you care about. Know why you matter. And make it up as you go. Tell the story as you go. Align your story around that truth. And I believe that if you invest in discovering that hidden truth, and if you, if you tell that story well, that there's no telling where that story can take you. Thanks, guys. So I think we're supposed to do questions now, right? Is that how this works? Absolutely. So, questions? Anyone? Yo. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's, I don't know if I can use, can I use client names and stuff like that? Yeah. I'll tell a story that, that I think wasn't, that isn't mine, right? I'll tell one for uh, Nicole, the um, a Better World thing. I think that's, that's a good one. We had a client come to us with, uh, it's basically a game, sort of a video game. 
Uh, and it's, it's sort of this whole idea of pay it forward. That's sort of the idea. And um, I think that, that really they just wanted to raise awareness. They wanted to get the, I mean, it's what we always want to do. We want to get, make sure people hear about, know about our thing. And there was a lot of ideas that got tossed around. And uh, do we show, do we tell the story this way? Do we tell the story that way? And what they came up with was a story that I think surpassed this idea of like, wouldn't it be fun if, and more so told the value. And it, it really, what it did is it showed um, one character doing something for another person, and one, that person doing something for the next, and that person doing something for the next. And just the execution of that story, I think created a much larger epiphany around um, the value versus just like the function that this game provided. Um, I, I wish I, 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 I don't know if I could even pull it up, but, but I think that's one of those instances where people come, they just want a video, they just want something that they can put out there that will raise awareness. And this is a, I think it's a video that when you watch, you're like, whoa, this actually really inspires me to live my life different. Not even, not even you know, having anything to do necessarily with the video game itself, though the video game is certainly part of the story, but it took me beyond the video game to actually caring about this very human thing of living and serving other people. And so I think the, that was a bit of a surprise uh, and an unexpected uh, result for the, the client um, to be able to do that, which is pretty exciting. Yeah, what else? So you talk about a lot about how fear gets in the way of work and in the way of life. Um, so how do you live more boldly? Live more boldly, yeah. He was just asking, you know, I talked about fear and how do you live more boldly? I think one of the things, I'll just speak from my own personal experience, is I had to have a pretty significant uh, shift in my own mindset, um, which is, I, I believe that there are sort of two camps that we fall in. One is where we basically think that we are as talented as we're ever going to get, and we're constantly trying to prove ourselves um, time and time and time again. Every time we face a new project, that's just one more chance where we could fail and lose our special status. Uh, every new challenge is really just a, a pitfall waiting to happen. And there are a lot of us that live that way, and we've somehow successfully dodged those, those manholes long enough to still retain whatever sort of special successful status we feel like we have. But I actually think it's a really dangerous way to live. It's a really, I think, torturous way to live because you always feel like you're going to lose everything and fail any, mo any given moment. For me, the, mind sh the mindset shift was that my goal isn't to you know, live up to some status or prove to people around me that I am something more than I am, but more so that my objective is just simply to learn and grow, that that, that in and of itself is enough. Because I know that over time, while I may experience failures here and failures there, I know that the overall trajectory of my life is headed in a direction that I can get excited about because I'm constantly prioritizing learning and growing. So, a new, a new project, a new challenge, isn't some pitfall waiting to happen. It's a growth opportunity that I'm about to walk into. Um, and, and you can, I think, uh, carry that over into a lot of different scenarios uh, from, from the challenges we face to the recognition we see other people getting, um, the feedback that we receive from people, right? If you're always worried about protecting your status, feedback is a threat. If you're just focused on growth, it's a gift, right? There's all these different, everything gets reinterpreted when your goal is no longer to prove to the world around you that you're something that maybe you aren't. And your new goal is just simply to, to continuously grow and develop and evolve. So that's kind of how I've tried to handle that fear is to kind of put it in its right place by changing that story, that part of my story. Yeah, what else? Uh, <clears throat> so, it, like, you guys create these videos and try and make them short, but at some point, your client has to explain that to you guys to learn it. Is that process kind of like that hour-long sit-down, or is that, like, way more involved, right. like, over days and weeks? Yeah, the, just that discovery stage of the process is really fun. Um, it does usually start with, a, like you said, a, an hour phone call where we jump on the phone with our clients and we just get them talking, we ask questions. They've sent us a some information ahead of time and then they always, not always, but a lot of times they'll send us stuff afterwards. Um, but it's really, it just comes down to having that initial conversation and then there's some sort of circle ups that we do after the fact. 
where we we as a team just work to discern it and it it's a it's sort of a skill just like anything else you know when we bring new people on um, they're sort of they kind of have to get their bearings and it's funny when you watch the people who have been doing that job a little longer how sort of quickly they can like there it is uh, and it takes some of the newer people a little longer to to really get that that proficiency but I think it's just like anything else you, you build that muscle and it's it's sort of a radar for meaning you know there, there's there's always going to be competing ideas and competing meanings in everything and trying to discern and figure out what's the most meaningful though right yeah this can be the simplest way to explain what it does but what it does isn't nearly as important as why it matters uh, and so let's tell the story around why it matters um, first and foremost and only get into the what and the how in so much as it helps people to understand why it, uh, it, it matters I don't know if that helps to answer your question or not but it's it's a it's a couple of conversations at the beginning uh, and then that can always lead to deeper conversations if what we propose to the to the client isn't the story that they want to tell or isn't the truth that they want to reveal but we try and make it really collaborative uh, be, uh, not only w internally but with the client um, really want to work as a team with them yeah what was your background and experience before you were doing that ha <laughs> that's a great question um, so I spent 12 years uh, or so ish in uh, church ministry I worked on sta staff at a church did a lot of different things from communication to music to creative to management um, thrown in the mix there's uh, some like other music ventures uh, my first trade was carpentry um, so I'm kind of good with my hands um, but yeah I just I kind of have a, a love for a lot of different things and and honestly people you know, I've, I've had, I had to go through this like weird insecurity phase when I first started working at Epiphio because I'm on the phone with these like Fortune 500, you know, clients. People. I'm like, I have no business being on the phone with these people. I don't know anything about marketing. And I was always afraid that they were going to ask me that question, that they're always going to be like, so what did you do before you came to Epiphio? And, and of course, I, I, sorry, you're breaking up. I, I didn't, I didn't hear, but, uh, but. But here's the, here's the funny thing. Here's the funny thing about that. I actually think that that experience, I, don't, I, think that, I think that there are few experiences that it could have prepared me as well for this job as that job. Mainly because when it comes to discerning truth and telling stories, it's all about understanding people, right? It's how do people work? What do they care about? What's meaningful to them? In ministry, all I ever did was deal with people and talk with people and understand what they go through um, and and I oh and I've also had to kind of reassure myself that like I've had to answer some pretty tough questions like how does the Trinity work and like what's what's up how could a good God let bad things happen to good people so I'm pretty sure I can handle your like cloud computing thing right like <laughs> I'm not super worried about it um, in in so I don't know, that's just kind of like where I had to uh, sort of suss out there on, the, on that whole like insecurity thing. But yeah, it's a bit of an, it's a sort of an unlikely path, but it sort of makes sense in hindsight. How do you get uh, a group of people to, like whether, whether, whether you're a teacher or whether you're you know, a pastor or like leading a group of story leads, how do you get them to constantly move past that point of, of fear and kind of clamoring, competing, trying to like gain titles? How do you how do you keep things, you know, growing rather than get this like competitive fear thing to happen? Yeah. That's Devin, by the way, he's one of our writers. Um, I asked him to ask that question. So <laughs> Yeah, no, he said Basically, how do you, you know, that whole idea of like moving past fear, how do you lead a team of people into in that journey of overcoming the, the fear and the insecurity and the not wanting to, to, to fail in front of others? Is that, that's sort of yeah. what you're asking. Um, you know, I, I think that that's sort of the essence really of, of leadership is helping people live something bigger um, than what they really are um, currently living. First and foremost, I think it's by example. 
I think um, as leaders, whatever capacity you lead in, whether it's leading your family or leading your organization, you have to fail publicly. I think that's first and foremost. If, they, if the message is always, hey, it's totally cool to fail, don't feel bad about it, but then they, no one ever sees you failing, that's a huge problem. Um, and so I think first and foremost, be open and honest and very, very public and transparent with your failures. So, and then the second thing I think is what gets rewarded gets repeated um, and what gets celebrated uh, is what basically becomes normal in your organization. And so I think we always, we're really, some of us who want to try and be forward thinking, we're good at, at sort of like, yeah, let's take risks and let's, let's fail and let's, do, but then we never celebrate those failures. We only ever celebrate the wins, right? And I think that that, again, sends a defeating message. Um, I would love to, to like have like a greatest misses, uh, you know, celebration of like, these were like the biggest strikeouts of the, of the month, right? The things that we, <laughs> man, we like really, really like screwed that one up, you know? Um, and then, you know, obviously what can be learned from that. But man, I feel like we need to celebrate that stuff a little bit better. So be transparent with your own failures and then celebrate those things um, publicly, I think is maybe two ways you could do that. So, oh, yeah. Ladies first, okay. sorry. Um, so on the topic of the glory of um, failing while faring greatly, um, didn't, do your clients come to you with expecting the possibility that, that they're going out there on the limb and that might happen, or are they always expecting success? You know, it's funny, like we, re we, deal, we have to deal with expectation a lot. The question was basically what are clients' expectations? How often are they, are they expecting this like journey into the like mysterious, mystical unknown and who knows what comes out on the other end versus like I want an epiphio, right? This is not hard. Give me an epiphio. You know that video we just watched? Just give me that with our brand, right? And we get that a lot. We get a lot of clients who will say like, man, I saw your homepage video. If I could just put my logo at the end of it, that'd be great. <laughs> Um, and we're like, can do. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, I, I think most of the time, I think if I was, if I'm completely honest, most of the time they come in sort of knowing a, a little bit of what they want and they're not super open to this like really experimental sort of journey to the other side. Um, that's not to say that we don't try and like sort of lead them there, but I don't think that's the expectation. I think as people, we're just that way. I think we love having control and we love knowing what we're getting, right? I mean, we love showing up to the showroom floor and saying, give me that one, right? We don't want to go to the factory and just say, whatever comes out on the other end is going to be awesome. So I don't blame clients at all for that, but that's, I mean, that's sort of why we're valuable as storytellers is that we're able to say, hey, have you ever thought about maybe this? And we have to do a lot of selling, even as, as creatives, we're not salesmen, but we do have to sell them on that idea. And so we, we, we're, we're, I feel like we're getting better at that, of like, hey, let's, let's maybe try this, this other thing. Um, and then of course, if it fails, then we just blame the client. Um, and, <laughs> No, we, we, we really try and do our best to always absorb the risk and, and really do them a good service. So, great question. Somebody back? Yeah, you had a question back there? You mentioned that it was also higher your story. Yeah. So how are some Yeah. Um, a lot of it's through relation. The, the question was how have we found some of our story leads? Um, a lot of it's through relational connection. At Epiphio, like, I'll be honest, like, I just love the people I work with. Um, we're, we're really protective of that relational chemistry and that we want to hire people that, quite frankly, we want to hang out with because they're the people that we hang out with. Um, you know, I spend my weekends with people that I work with and it's not weird and it's not forced. And I think that that's a, a bit of what makes us effective at our jobs. But, so I think first is just like, do we like this person? Right? Do we want to spend a lot of time with them? But beyond that, I think the proof is in the pudding. Um, the people that we've hired really, like I said, don't come from like the advertising and marketing world. 
Uh, and so we, one of the things that's become most effective for us is just like giving them the quick hack. Like, hey, here, do make an epiphio. Show us what you've got. Um, I don't care where you come from, what you've done before, if you have zero experience. If you can do the job, then let's, let's do this thing. So it's more of just like, show us what you've got and we'll talk. Uh, and, and that's what we've found to be the most effective method of hiring. I mean, I've hired, we hired, I don't know, five or six people recently in the past six months. I don't know if I, I don't know if I saw their resume. Like I, I don't really care. Um, I really don't. You know, make a video for me. Show me what you can do. Win me over. I was, you know, here's, here's what's funny about that question is I would interview people and I would ask them like, why, you know, why do you want to work here? All the typical questions. And they would say these things like, I just love telling stories. Oh, tell me a story. Uh, <laughs> I'm like, what the heck? You, if you love telling stories, then tell me a freaking story right now. Uh, and so I think that's just, you know, just being that like, that sounds like, I don't know, maybe that's unprofessional. I don't know. Again, I don't know how this is supposed to work. But like, if you love to do something, then just do it. And if you're good at it, then you can come do it for money. Um, but like, yeah, so I don't know. That's just sort of how we've evolved over time is just like, it's gone from just like, hey, this guy has a brain. Let's hire him. He can write things to like, okay, let's really under, like see how you do in the job. We're getting better at that. But again, I think it just comes down to proofs in the pudding. Let's see what you can do. And if you can do it, great. Key pillars. She's asking, are there any key pillars as we're telling stories? Yeah. yeah. So I'll give away probably the, what I think is the most uh, simplistic and obvious uh, to sort of the method to our madness. We try not to be formulaic, but you know sometimes there's room for structure. If you watch any of our videos, um, they they can all be folded in half. Uh, we call it the old story, new story. There's an old way of doing things, and it looks like this. And it sucks, and you hate it, and it's frustrating, and it eats up your time, and you wish that you could do it a different way, but you can't. And ultimately, here's what it costs you. But there's a better way, and here's what that better way looks like, and here's what it gets you at the end. However many, I don't know, a thousand videos or something? How many videos have we done? A thousand, fifteen hundred videos in? That's still working for us. Um, I think there's just something about <coughs> that, that like simple, very um, human thing of like, this is you, this is your experience, this is what you're going through, this is why it hurts. Man, that sucks, doesn't it? And I think the reason that works, and, and in all seriousness, our clients really, really struggle with that formula, or if you want to call it that, because they want to talk about their thing sooner, right? They want, every, you know, I don't, again, I'm not blaming them. Like, but they're paying good money for this thing, and if they could have it their way, the opening line to every video would be introducing the latest, greatest, brandest, newest, thingest. Like, it's, but like nobody cares about that story, right? Like as soon as you start telling that story, I immediately want to change the channel. But if you talk about me, right? Let's talk about me as the audience. Um, okay, yeah, I'd like to hear that. And it's fun, and it's engaging, and we like it. Uh, it's really effective. And then when I introduce the newest, greatest, you know, thingiest thingy, uh, I actually care about that now because I know what the story is about. I know why I should care about this product or service or brand because it's not about the product or service or brand. It's about me um, and how the two intersect. So I would say that's probably the, the biggest, like, most on the nose at face value thing that we, we live into a lot. But not always. We do some videos that don't follow that, that story arc. Yeah? Uh, do you, any of your clients fall off when you have them investigate too much truth about themselves? <laughs> we don't want everyone to know. Dude, them. yeah. What's funny is I've had to fire clients before um, where they, they, we like got into what their thing was. 
And it was like, uh, yeah, the world is not going to be a better place if, if people know about this. Um, and, and so, I've, I mean, I've had, to, I've had to do that before. And it's been an ugly conversation. Clients don't want to hear that, right? But our, our name's at the end of these things, too. And that truth, I mean, we want to stand for truth. We want to stand for something meaningful and valuable. And there are more important things than this money than uh, more important things in this world than money, um, even for us uh, as a business. And so, yeah, we've we've done that before. And and it's you know to to to, I think if you're asking sort of a variation of that question of like, man, it's just so hard. I I remember one of the, I I wrote a script that was I think probably the best script I have ever written for a client, right? And I got them on the phone. I mean, I was like so, I was so excited to read them. I'm like, they are going to flip when they hear this thing, right? And I get them on the phone. It's like VP of this and that and the other. And I read them the script. And I'm like, yes. <laughs> and they were like, uh, I don't really get it. Um, it just sounds like a bunch of like jargon. And that's just, oh, you're like, no, like, this is amazing. This is, and it wasn't about my writing or the thing that I'd done, but it was like, we found this nugget. We found this thing that's like, your thing matters for this reason, and people will care about this. And they were just like, yeah, that's kind of not what we want to talk about. And man, it's just, it's just so hard. It's so hard. Because um, you got to get back on that horse, right? And still... You don't want to phone it in from that point. That's the temptation. It's always like, well, screw you then. Like, you want a bad video? We'll give you a bad video. Like, <laughs> like, like that's lame. That's not how it works, you know? Um, so, so it's getting back on that horse and fighting that fight. Uh, and, and I think good things come out on the end, both for the, the video and for the relationship, which is, is really important. Anything else? We got a few more minutes. Another question? Come on, one, one last question. What's the worst thing you've ever done? Never told anyone. And never told anyone? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you don't have to answer one. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I, the list is long. Yeah, any, any, any other questions before we wrap? <laughs> please, please. No? One last one. Um, so someone asked me this recently. They were, they were talking about creative strategies. It's more important to be right, which is interesting. Especially when you're spending someone else's money. What's the question? It, in creative strategies, is it more important to be right or to be interesting? Yes. <laughs> I would say, here's, here's how I would approach that. I think it's most important to be effective. Um, we, I, 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 I remember this axiom a lot uh, in that those who try to be both original and effective are often neither. Um, and as, crea as creatives, we really want to be like, whether you want to call that interesting or original or whatever, we always want to be that. Um, and certainly rightness is in there somewhere. Um, I think that's probably our ego in that whole bit. I think the most important thing is being effective. Um, so I'm always looking at our work that way. It's, uh, there's nothing new under the sun. There's nothing um, that's uniquely unique. So if that's interesting, let's call it that. There's nothing that's interesting. I don't know if I would say that. But, <laughs> but I think just approaching it as a creator and asking yourself, will this be effective? Because you can create something that is very interesting, but very ineffective, right? There's plenty of commercials out there that are effective in, or uh, interesting in drawing in my attention. So, I'm never gonna buy that. I've never, I haven't been persuaded by, at all. I haven't been influenced by that. It was interesting, but it actually hasn't done its job. I would have rather seen something that was perhaps less original or interesting, but more effective. Um, I don't know. That's how I would answer that question. Hey, guys, I thank you so much for sitting through that. Thank you.